Welcome. This lecture is being given in support of English Olympiad students. Those of you who are writing the National English Olympiad exam in 2022 for SACI, the South African Council for English Education. It is one of two lectures. The details may be found on my website, which is number four, muse.org. Details below. Brave New World. The title of this year's English Olympiad Anthology challenges the reader to contemplate momentous change. Perhaps change in which we are required to reshape, reconsider, reconstruct ourselves and our world. They are words that may have fallen inadvertently from our lips over the last two years as we struggled to come to terms with our global pandemic, our COVID-19 world. They are words that may have been tinged with sadness, even despair and depression. Or they may have been words which conjured up new possibilities, hitherto unthought of for as the, as the future inevitably draws closer. The title has many literary allusions. It first appears in the extract from The Tempest, uh, which was Act 5, and The Tempest, of course, is the last play that Shakespeare wrote on his own before he died. As a romance, The Tempest transforms theatrical illus illusions to something that is rich and strange. Using visionary and expressionistic forms to depict illusion and dream. The realistic events of the play that occurred in the past have already happened by the time we are thrust into the chaos of the storm in Act 1, Scene 1. The events of the past that happened off stage um, include Antonio, Prospero's wicked brother, using the help of Alonso, the king of Naples, in order to usurp his brother's dukedom. Antonio ruthlessly casts Prospero and his three-year-old daughter out to sea. Miraculously, they survive and end up on an enchanted island where Prospero raises his child and devotes himself to magic. The extract from Act 5 that appears in the anthology depicts Miranda as 
now as a young lady being brought together with those who wronged her father. And it's all engineered by the magic of Prospero. When the scene opens, Miranda and Ferdinand um, appear playing chess together. Their exchange is playful and innocent. Miranda, sweet lord, you play me false. Ferdinand, no, my dearest love, I would not for the world. In the scene, Alonso's relief that his son is alive is almost palpable. And he even regards Miranda as a goddess who reunited him with his son. It is in this context that Miranda, in her innocence, having never seen any other man besides her father and Caliban, speaks the famous words used as the title of the anthology. Oh, wonder, how many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is! Oh, brave new world that has such people in it! Miranda embodies the quality of wonder, even in her name. Ferdinand refers to her as admired Miranda. And she also describes the brave new world that Shakespeare envisions as the state in which man has finally recovered from the fall. Miranda is filled with wonder at the possibility of a new world with other wondrous human beings in it. She is wholly innocent and ignorant of possible evil inherent in this change. The movement of the play is captured embryonically in the short extract from Ferdinand innocently kneeling for his father's blessing to his father, tortured by the knowledge of his own crimes and cries as he pledges to be a father to Miranda. But oh, how oddly it will sound that I must ask my child's forgiveness. The vividly contrasting nuances bring to mind the contrasts in the songs of innocence and the songs of experience by William Blake. The world of innocence is a domestic world, a pastoral world. It is a wonderful world where everything is simple and understandable. In the lamb, the child asks the question because he knows the answer and he wants to share it with the lamb. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. I a child and thou a lamb. 
we are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. In a similar way, secluded on their island, Miranda's questions are answered by a loving, provident Prospero. In the Songs of Experience, the contrasting poem is the tiger. The tiger is never described but presented as an abstract, fearful symmetry. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? The dominant image is in the forests of the night with all its connotations of tangled roots and perplexing ways. The questions are never answered in the tiger. There is simply a looming sense of fear. What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? Layer upon layer of perplexing questions disturb the reader. But in the end, men have lost control and fear is intensified. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Arguably, in the world of experience in the tempest, Caliban attempts to rape Miranda. Antonio usurps his brother Prospero's dukedom with the help of Alonso. His wickedness knows no bounds as he casts his own brother and vulnerable three-year-old niece out into the storm to die. For Blake, though, there are different stages of innocence. Innocence which precedes experience, as we see in Miranda. The second stage is experience. And lastly, the third stage is an innocence which transcends experience, resulting in a wisdom based on full knowledge of its contraries. In Prospero's empathetic response to Alonso, his former enemy's anguish at the end of the given extract, we see a movement towards harmony and grace and good as he freely forgives Alonso. There, sir, stop. Let us not burden our remembrance with a heaviness that's gone. Arguably, in this magnanimous act, he can retain the grace and wisdom which reaches towards an idyllic world, whilst knowing the human limitations that make its full realisation unlikely. In the 1932 science fiction novel Brave New World, 
The author, Aldous Huxley, candidly borrowed the title from Miranda's words in Shakespeare's The Tempest. Just as the compilers of the anthology, in turn, borrowed the same words for the title of the English Olympiad anthology. In fact, Huxley had such profound respect and admiration for Shakespeare that he also used quotes from Shakespeare's plays, Measure for Measure and Macbeth, for another two novels of his. His last words in print, his essays, Shakespeare and Religion in 1965, were about Shakespeare and the marked influence he had on his work. Indeed, he was so obsessed with Shakespeare that he began to see a parallel between Shakespeare's life and growth to artistic maturity and his own. It is not surprising that Huxley, finding in the trends of the 1930s this was just after World War I and just preceding World War II, finding no reason to share Miranda's optimism, should give the phrase brave new world a satirical twist in his dystopian novel. The novel anticipates a time when human reproduction will be replaced by lo laboratory-grown humanoids, mostly genetically identical clones in batches of about 96 at a time. They are bred to fulfill the requirements of society. The given extract introduces us to the ironically named savage who has existed outside of the structured society of infant nurseries and neo-Pavlovian conditioning rooms at a time when he is grieving the death of his parent, Linda. On page 13. He woke once more to the eternal reality, looked around him, knew what he saw, knew it with a sinking sense of horror and disgust. For the recurrent delirium of his days and nights, the nightmare of swarming, indistinguishable sameness. Twins, twins, like maggots, they swarm defilingly over the mystery of Linda's death. Maggots again, but larger, full-grown, they now crawled across his grief and his repentance, he halted and with bewildered and horrified eyes stared around him at the khaki mob in the midst of which, overtopping it by a full head, he stood. How many goodly creatures are there here? The singing words mocked him derisively. How beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world.
the indistinguishable sameness of the human creatures engineered in a laboratory is portrayed as repulsive in their comparison to maggots. The inception of human beings has been vilified and debased in this bleak, futuristic vision. The words of Miranda in Shakespeare's Tempest fill the head of the savage, and we are told that the singing words mocked him derisively. For an epigraph, Huxley chose a quote from the Russian philosopher Nicholas Berdyaev, who wrote, Utopias seem to be much more achievable than we formerly believed them to be. Now we are presented with another alarming question. How to prevent utopias from coming into existence? His words resonate with derision and irony. The technological and scientific advances of our world 90 years after Brave New World was published, make Huxley's dystopian world chillingly plausible. As John Savage listens to Mustafa Mund explain what he perceives to be a utopia, Christianity without tears, that's what Soma is. His horror bursts out in the words of Shakespeare. But the tears are necessary. Don't you remember what Othello said? If after every tempest came such calms, May the winds blow till they have wakened death. In a novel that offers layer upon layer of irony, the supreme irony must surely be that the savage, who is regarded as uncivilized, has a full imaginative vision of life, in contrast to the mainly mechanical and functional existence of the inhabitants of a brave new world. Unlike them, he is able to decide what he wants for himself. Turn to page 17, bottom of the page. I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. I want freedom. I want goodness. I want sin. In fact, said Mustafa Mond. You're claiming the right to be unhappy. Not to mention the right to grow old and ugly and impotent, the right to have syphilis and cancer, the right to have too little to eat, the right to live in constant apprehension of what may happen tomorrow, the right to catch typhoid, Void, the right to be tortured by unspeakable pains of every kind. There was a long silence. I claim them all, 
said the savage at last. Mustafa Mond shrugged his shoulders. You're welcome, he said. It is in the striking contrast between the savage's freedom to choose, his outright rejection of the administration's attempts to control him absolutely, and Mustafa Mun's ironic reply, You're welcome. A more profound satire is conveyed and a greater irony than age, pain, disease and death. I decided to conclude my lecture with a wonderful fresh view of the contrast between innocence and the world of experience as experienced in South Africa. On page 11, on behalf of the Born Freeze by Mobile Leruo Mope. I'm only 16. I'm not trying to tell you how to live your lives. But I was often told as a kid that life isn't always so black and white. There's no white privilege or black privilege, just very lucky people. And if you take the melanin out of the equation, you'll find that both sides of the spectrum are equal. You see, White people in this country are as guilty of history as black people are of the present. And the reason both cultures contrast each other is so that we can be interdependent. Like I said, I'm 16 and naive. I'm not trying to tell you how to live. But there'd be so much less anger if this country could forgive the way Madiba did. With white blood staining black hands and black blood staining white hand, there's no racial preservation and age-old grudges will not help the future of this nation. Now, I'm 16. This country has issues and I'm not single-handedly trying to resolve them. But I know the hate you have for the opposite race is definitely a part of the problem. Mkosi Sikeleli Africa, we'll sing. As a people, We'll pray for blessings and salvation. But if you think about this logically, you're asking a loving God to bless an angry, hateful nation? We need to forgive the past. Realize there's not a thing that will change it. Leave the present in God's hands instead of trying to rearrange it. Now, I'm not asking everyone to spread the love they don't have. I'm just asking this country to make its motto come alive. Unity in diversity. That's the only way this South Africa will strive. Umuntu. Ngumuntu, Ngabantu. People are not skin. We shouldn't give all this power to a pigment as small as melanin. So stop focusing on the black and white. 
build a better country for us, please. Our future is in your hands. I'm only 16. As the poet skillfully counterbalances the world of experience, the world of the complex issues of adulthood against the innocence and vulnerability of innocence, I'm only 16. The poet portrays herself as the spokesperson of the born freeze. The born freeze are those born into the new South Africa, those not tainted by South Africa's troubled, racist past, those who never experienced white rule. The repetition of I'm 16 disarms the reader and inclines the reader to listen to the opinion expressed. The poet claims that she is not telling us how to live our lives. Do you think this is true? Or is it possible to argue that throughout the poem, she is making every attempt to persuade us to live our lives as Madiba did? The concluding stanza is a powerful plea. So stop focusing on black and white. Build a better country for us, please. The closing lines, our future is in your hands. I'm only 16, are poignant and touching, evoking a keen sense of sadness and regret. It is fitting that this lecture, which began with Shakespeare, should end with Shakespeare. I have already noted the move towards magnanimity, grace and wisdom in Prospero's forgiveness of Alonso in the extract from The Tempest. Similarly, in William Blake, we noted the depiction of states of innocence contrasted by states of experience and ultimately an innocence that transcends experience in wisdom. In On Behalf of the Born Freeze, we are urged to a similar transformation. Like I said, I'm 16 and naive. I'm not trying to tell you how to live, but there'd be so much less anger if this country could forgive the way Madiba did. And then again, we need to forgive the past. Realize there's not a thing that will change it. Leave the present in God's hands instead of trying to rearrange it. She leaves us with an image that has carried South Africa through periods of crisis. She says, I'm just asking the country to make its motto come alive, unity in diversity. Despite the disparaging dystopic realities, these texts suggest that our conscious decisions have to reach heavenward and towards a true utopia. Well, nothing remains but for me to wish you all good luck, 
for your English Olympiad examination and a happy journey through your interesting anthology, Brave New World. Please remember to subscribe and click the bell below and for more information about English Olympiad lectures visit me at my website formuse.org